In this series, we are not asking the question, what would Jesus do? We're asking, what would Jesus undo? What would Jesus undo? And if you've been tracking along with us, you know that it's been a pretty tough series. It's been challenging. I can tell you that God has slapped the taste out of my mouth several times because the truth is we all have areas in our lives where we have become apathetic, where we have become spiritually apathetic unconcerned about God and the things of his kingdom. So what would Jesus undo? He would undo spiritual apathy. And we all have those moments when we offer up an empty gift to God, just kind of going through the motions. What would Jesus undo? He would undo hollow and empty worship, worshiping in vain. And like we talked about last week, Everyone wears different masks of hypocrisy in their lives, where we put on a show on the outside, but, but, but it's really different from who we are on the inside. So what would Jesus undo? He would undo hypocrisy. For the fourth and final part of this series, we're going we're to take a look at one more spiritual hang-up that grieves the heart of God, and we're going to look at Jesus undoing spiritual pride. Jesus would undo spiritual pride. When we find our value and our meaning in ourselves, when we find our value in what we accomplish and how we compare with others rather than finding value in him. To introduce today's theme, I wanna share a parable with you, an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. In a certain pond on one of the farms in southeastern North Carolina, there are two ducks and a frog and these neighbors, they were the best of friends. All day long, they, they used to play together. But as the hot summer days came, the pond began to dry up. And soon there was such little water that they all realized that they would have to move on and find another pond. Now the ducks, they could easily f fly to another place. But, but what about their friend, the frog? I've got it, said one of the ducks. Here's what we're going to do. He had come up with a great idea. And so it was decided that they would put a stick in the bill of each duck, and then the frog would hang on to that stick with his mouth, and they would fly him to another pond. And so off they went. As they were flying, a farmer out in his field, he looked up and he saw them and he said, well, isn't that a clever idea? I wonder who thought of that. At that moment, the frog said, I did. splat. Proverbs 29 verse 23 says that pride will bring a person low. Again, we've all had those moments where our pride has gotten the best of us. When you've made the decision, I'm going to do it my way. I don't want your help. I don't want your constructive feedback. I don't want your ideas or I'm going to take credit for your ideas. Pride. We're going to do things my way because I'm very capable. I'm able. I'm actually the best at this. I, I'm way better than those other knuckleheads. And then whatever it is, it turns into a huge mess. Pride comes before the what? Fall. The fall. Yeah, pride comes before the fall. Scripture actually says pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. And so Jesus, he would undo spiritual pride in our lives because he does not want us to experience the fall and the destruction that comes after. So let's take a look at another parable. This one comes from the Bible, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus tells this parable in Luke chapter 18. But I want to give you guys a heads up. I think Jesus, the master storyteller, I think he's going to tell us something today that's going to be the most challenging in this whole series of sermons. What would Jesus undo? I, I've heard it said before, one of the most loving things that you can do for another person is to look them in the eye and tell them the truth. And Jesus is going to look us in the eye and God's word in the flesh is going to tell us the truth because he loves us. Luke chapter 18 Beginning in verse 9, Jesus tells this story about two guys who go to the same place for the same purpose. Two guys. One of the guys is a Pharisee. Hooray, the good guy. The other guy is a tax collector. Boo, the bad guy. They go to the temple, this physical place, this visible place for the presence of God. They go there so they can pray to God. And Jesus, he tells us what they actually pray. 
That's the setup for this earthly story. Two guys walk into a temple. Luke writes, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. So Jesus, he singles out a group of people and he tells this story to them because they trusted in themselves. People who place their hope in themselves. People who who put their fate in themselves. Why? It's because it says they viewed themselves as righteous. I, I do the right things, therefore I am right before God. And because they viewed themselves as righteous, the Bible says that they viewed others with contempt. They were confident of their own righteousness and they looked down on everyone else. And this is a huge principle in our lives. We can't get away from it. Your relationship with God cannot be separated from your relationship with other people. The vertical, the vertical always impacts the horizontal. Let me say that again. Your relationship with God cannot be separated from your relationship with others. They were right with God, and so they look down on others. So Jesus, he's speaking to a select audience. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, who was the Pharisee? He was the respected religious leader in his day and time. He was respected. Because there were over 600 laws in the Old Testament, and this guy, he remembered every single one of them, and and he followed the law to a T. He was respected in his community. So he was like a preacher or an elder going to church. He's going to the temple to pray. And then you have the tax collector. Some translations of the Bible say that he was a despised tax collector. Because he didn't just collect taxes for his government, he collected taxes for the Roman Empire that had come in and occupied his country and oppressed his people. And out of the taxes that he was collecting, he was funding the expansion of that very empire throughout the rest of the world. And so this guy who you grew up with, he, he, he was taking your money. He was taking your money to fund the government that was at, occupying your country. And on top of that, he took more money than than required in order to make himself wealthy. So if the Pharisee is like a a respected Bible teacher heading to church, this tax collector, he's like a corrupt politician who is lining his own pockets. He's like the opioid drug dealer who's selling drugs in his own neighborhood to make himself wealthy, to make himself rich. The despised tax collector. They go to the temple to talk to God, and this is what happens. Jesus, he sets it up nicely. He he is setting this story up nicely. We have the good guy, and we have the bad guy. And and it doesn't matter if you've never heard this story before, because you have heard this story before. It's the Jedis and the Sith Lords in Star Wars. It's Jim and Dwight from The Office. It's the Avengers and Thanos. It's, it's the Justice League and, well, nobody cares about that, right? <laughs> Think about it. It's the good guy and the bad guy. It's Chuck Norris and whatever poor soul is going to try to fight Chuck Norris. The good guy and the bad guy. Jesus says, so the Pharisee stood up. He stood up by himself. He distanced himself from everybody else who was there to do the same thing, to to go to the temple and pray. He separated himself, and this is what he prays. God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people. God, I thank you that I'm not like the swindlers and the unjust and the adulterers or even like this lowly tax collector. I'm not like them because I fast twice a week. I'm not like... these other people because I pay tithes on everything that I get. Actually, for your information, I I tithe before taxes are taken out of my paycheck. God, I thank you that I do the right things, and, and, and I thank you that I'm better than everyone else who is around me. And get this, the Pharisee, he wasn't completely wrong. He had some good things going in his life. 
He has some good things going on. Think about it. By the age of 12, he would have memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Like word for word memorized. He spent time in God's word. He tried to do what was right in his life. He had some good things going on, but instead of seeing these good things in his life as a gift from God, he somehow began to see himself as the gift to God. Instead of, instead of seeing his life and these good things as a gift from God, he started viewing himself as the gift to God. And before we SMH, right, before we shake our heads at the Pharisee, I think it, it would be wise to acknowledge that there's a little bit of the Pharisee in each of us. Instead of, God, thank you so much that I get to be a part of, of the church where I can see, where, where I can hear about you moving in the lives of your children, where, where I can see the good things happening in your kingdom. Instead of that, it, it's, God, you're welcome that I showed up today because what can I say except you're welcome that's a catchy song. I'm not going to sing anymore. <laughs> God, you're welcome that I'm here today. God, God, you're welcome for my gift. You're welcome for my, my offering, my 10%. Because we stop seeing the good things in our life as a gift from God, and we begin to see ourselves as the gift to God. And over the course of time, we begin to experience spiritual pride. And spiritual pride, it hurts the heart of God. Spiritual pride and our spiritual enemy, it promises us three things, and these are false promises from, from our enemy. Spiritual pride promises us self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency, I've got this, i got what it takes, I don't need anybody else, look at what I've accomplished, look, look at the, the good things that I've done. It, it, it promises us self-sufficiency. Spiritual pride promises us self-importance. I have value. I have an important job. I have a sweet house. I have the perfect family. I serve in a leadership position at church. I have value because I am self-sufficient, and, and, and therefore I'm self-important, and that will lead us to believing that I am worthy of self-exaltation. Everybody, look at me. Give me the credit. Give me the honor. Give me the glory. And, and, and these false promises from our spiritual enemy, these false promises of spiritual pride, it creates an inward emotion that leads to, to some outward behaviors that we would never want to be associated with. It, it changes us in here, and then we start acting ugly toward other people. I didn't get my first car, my first vehicle, until my sophomore year of college. I was 19 years old. I got a 1989 Mercury Topaz. And this is, not, this is not my actual car, but that's the same year and the same color. And, and I got to tell you, that car helped create a little bit of a, helped develop some character in my life. I quickly upgraded that car for a 1988 Honda Civic because on my first trip back home during fall break, the Topaz broke down on the interstate on Interstate 95. So I, I, went, I went backwards in time and got an 88 Honda Civic. <laughs> the truth is our, our family, my family, never had, never had brand new vehicles. That's just the way it was. We were not a wealthy family. Not a wealthy family. Well, I want you to flash forward in my life. I've been married for three years, and Honda... Honda releases the Element in 2003, and Jenny and I, we took one for a test drive, and we said, we'll take it. This is what we did. We leased a brand new car. Don't ever do that. <laughs> Don't ever do that. That was a terrible idea, but we did it. We leased a brand new car, and at that moment in time, some things changed for your boy, Matty Matt. My outlook and my attitude when it came to driving drastically changed. Instead of driving these beaters around, we were rolling in some brand new wheels with that new car smell. And people were checking us out. People were like, hey, can we look inside that thing? It looks a little weird. <laughs> um, 
we, we had taken a trip from Harrisonburg, Virginia, down to Elizabeth City to visit some family, and, and we got stuck in, 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 in some traffic, standstill traffic, right in the Williamsburg area, the kind of traffic where you put the windows down, you kill the engine, and, and you get out and, and you meet some new people right there on the interstate. And lots of people were coming up to, hey, can we look inside that thing? Like, can I sit in the driver's seat? Like, it kind of made me feel good. Like, that had never happened in my life. I was the man. I was in my element. <laughs> Trying to catch me riding dirty. I was better than those other people driving their junky cars. When Jenny was pregnant with Ezra and our family of, family of four at the time, when we finally moved into our new house, I'm going to make a confession. I, I admit that the thought crossed my mind, I really wish my dad could see this place. I really wish my dad could see this place. He would be so proud of me because I grew up in a, in a really small townhouse, a small townhouse with half the square footage of, of the house that, that we're living in right now. I shared a room with my brother most of my childhood. And so I wanted, I wanted my dad, who had passed away three months earlier, I wanted him to see our new house. I wanted dad to, to check out our new digs, this place that Jenny and I worked hard to purchase with no help from anyone else. We did this on our own with our jobs and with purchasing other property and selling that property. I have value. I am self-sufficient. I'm the man. Now, obviously, I was in a different car. I was in a different house. But what changed was my inner emotion that led to some different outer actions. And I have to tell you, spiritual pride is the exact same way. We experience the emotion like the Pharisee. And it leads to these, to these behaviors that we would never want to be associated with. Like, like the comments and the thoughts of comparison. Comparison. Look at what those other losers are driving. Look at their house. Look at what that hoochie mama is wearing. I would never be caught dead in that. Someone should have said something before she left the house. Why do we compare? Why do we compare? Because it's easier to have value and feel value in ourselves. It's easier to lift ourselves up by pushing others down. Moms and dads are classic for this. Hey, babe, I know we're not perfect parents, but so-and-so's kids, they are off the chain. Those kids are going to end up in prison if something doesn't change. And it makes us feel like we're a little bit better when we lift ourselves up by pushing others down. Maybe, maybe for you, you don't play the comparison game. Maybe, maybe for you, it's this thought, I, I, really, I don't really need God in my life because I'm a good person. It's the spiritual pride of, I'm good enough without God. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls who do, I'm a good person. Or maybe for you, it's fault finding. A little bit of what we talked about last week with hypocrisy. Maybe for you, it's fault finding because you are an expert in everybody else's faults. Because it's easier to focus on their faults than to allow God to address the faults in our own lives. Maybe it's not fault finding. Maybe it's attention seeking. Hey, everybody, look at me. We're, we're, we're more concerned with how many people like our Instagram post of a Bible verse than we are concerned with allowing God to speak to us through that Bible verse. And we spend our time, we spend our energy, we spend our effort trying to convince everybody else, trying to convince God, trying to convince ourselves that we're good, that we have value. Some of you guys struggle with, with the sneaky version of pride called reverse spiritual pride. Reverse spiritual pride goes like this. I, I can't receive a compliment with a simple and, and gracious thank you. And so instead, what I do is I deflect with sarcasm. I could never be used by God because I'm not, I'm not that good at anything. He hasn't given me a gift like he's given those other people. I could never share my faith with someone at work because I don't want to be that super religious person. And besides, I don't know enough Bible to share my faith with others. I could never, I could never. Well, guess what? I could never is reverse spiritual pride. And, and when you get down to the fundamental problem of spiritual pride, 
comparing, fault-finding, attention-seeking, self-sufficiency. This is coming from a preacher named Tim Doramus. He's one of the many preachers at Life Church. I, I've been using Life Church's series, What Would Jesus Undo? Um, it's been a great resource. The problem of, of spiritual pride, the preacher Tim, he says, it, it, when we're so full of ourselves, there is no room for God. Think about it. If I'm full of myself, there is no room for God. Look at the Pharisees' prayer. I got it together, and I'm better than everybody else. There is no room for God in that. But Jesus, Jesus Christ, he offers us a better way. He gives us a better way. Let's, let's pick back up in verse 13. Jesus says, but the tax collector who was standing some distance away. He couldn't even bring himself close enough. The Bible says he, he was unable to lift his eyes to heaven and he was beating his chest and he was saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me. Don't give me justice. Don't give me what I deserve. Have mercy on me because I'm a sinner. The despised tax collector understands something very important. If God doesn't intervene in his story, if God doesn't intervene in his life, he is hopeless. He understood that it was going to take divine, it was going to have to take divine intervention at that point in time. Because for him to be made right under the law, he was going to have to pay back everything that he's ever collected, plus 20% more. Every single penny that you've ever made plus a whole lot more. So who could do that? Who could ever do that? God, if you don't intervene in my situation, it's hopeless. And this is what Jesus says about his prayer in the next verse. I tell you, this man, not the respected Pharisee, this despised tax collector, went to his home justified. He went home in a right standing before God rather than the other man. For everyone who exalts himself Everyone who lifts themselves up will be humbled. They will be made low, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. You see, when we're so full of ourselves, there's no room for God. But when we empty ourselves, when we humble ourselves, we are in the perfect position. We are in that perfect place to be filled by God's grace. We're in the perfect position to be filled up with God's grace. And here is why that is really, really good news today. Some of you, you walked into this building today already feeling humbled. There's this life situation that has already humbled you. And maybe, maybe uh, it's some choices that, that, that you made. It, it, it's a life situation that has humbled you. It's some choices that you made that has brought you to a low place and you're already saying what the tax collector prayed. God, if you don't intervene in my life, I'm, I'm hopeless. The good news for you is that God, our good, good Father, He wants to intervene in your life through His Son, Jesus Christ. He wants to bring you hope. He wants to bring you mercy. He wants to bring you forgiveness. All we have to do is empty ourselves of ourselves to be in the perfect position to be filled up by God's grace. Some of you are here today, and there is a problem in your life, and you don't know how to fix it, and it's driving you nuts. It's exhausting. Maybe it's your grown adult child, and you're thinking, man, we did the best that we could with him, especially compared to those other parents. We did a pretty good job with Johnny, but now John is in this terrible place and you don't know how to fix it. Or, or maybe you're in this financial situation that you never intended to be in because you leased a brand new car and you don't know how to get yourself out of debt. Maybe it's your marriage and, and you're thinking right now, forget making it great. I don't even know how to make it work at this point in time. These situations are are isolating. These situations are depressing. And like I said, it, they drive us crazy. And then we, we have those moments, God, where are you? This isn't what I signed up for. Listen, you can posture yourself like the Pharisee and say, I can fix it. 
I will fix it. Look at what I've accomplished so far. Look at what I've done. I'm self-sufficient. I have value. I'm important. I can fix it, but you're not going to find what you're looking for. Spiritual pride, in the end, it gives us an unattainable goal. Spiritual pride just builds for us a prison that we find ourselves living in. Or you can choose the better way. We can choose the heavenly meaning of the earthly story that Jesus is trying to teach us. We can choose the way of the despised tax collector, and we can say, God, without you, my situation is hopeless. When we empty ourselves, when we humble ourselves, it puts us in the best place to fully rely on God, to fully depend on him. Jesus, he is looking us in the eye right now, and he is telling us the truth. The better way to live is with humility. When you empty yourself, not only are you in a great place to receive God's grace, you're in the perfect position to be used by him. When we humble ourselves, we're in the perfect position to be used by God. Here's a common misconception. People believe that being humble is a sign of weakness. A lot of people believe humility is a sign of weakness, but humility isn't about weakness. Humility is actually a position of strength. The big difference with humility versus pride is it's not my strength. It's not my sufficiency. It's not my importance. It's not my value. It's not my name being lifted up. Humility is a position of strength because God is sufficient through his son, Jesus Christ. He is enough for me. God is sufficient through his son, Jesus Christ. He is enough for me. So whether, so whether God uses me in a huge way, like how we, how we think about uh, different believers, uh, different Christians doing uh, amazing things, whether God uses me in a huge way, baptizing hundreds and hundreds of people like our our missionary brother Ezekiel Fish in Thailand and Burma or or if God uses me in kind of like an ordinary way of going to work and doing my best for his glory and then going home and loving my spouse and loving my children and maybe in my lifetime I'm not going to see any fruit outside of that that's still way more than I deserve It's more than I could ever earn because Jesus Christ is enough. And that's all the confidence, that's all the strength that we need. God has equipped us and he wants his name. He wants his name to be lifted up through us. Pride is about my glory. Pride is about making my name great. But humility is about God's glory. Humility is about God's glory. So how do we empty ourselves before God? There's a lot of ways. Last week we talked about confessing, confessing to an accountability partner, being honest, being open about those areas of hypocrisy in our lives and, and dropping the mask. I'll tell you another way, serving others, serving others. Some of us this past Wednesday, we, we saw nine teenagers talking about an upcoming missions trip toward the end of July, going to serve uh, some of the least of these in our, in our own city. Um, serving others is a great way to bring humility into our lives. There, there's another, another way uh, to empty yourself, and it, I want you to think about a question. When, when, you're experiencing, when you're experiencing those inward emotions that lead to those proud outward behaviors, Or maybe if you have a a fear inside you, maybe you got some anxiety when you're facing a decision. I want you to ask yourself this question. Is this about my glory? Just ask yourself that question. Is this about my glory? Is this about lifting my name up? Or is this about lifting God's name up? Because pride, it it will promise you freedom. Pride will promise you freedom through you being enough. And humility offers the freedom that you cannot experience outside of Jesus Christ. Is this about my glory? Or is this about God's glory? This is what Jesus says to us. Um, 
And uh, the DART organization chose to use this verse as, as the theme verse. I say DART, there's a display in the back, disaster assistance relief teams. Um, we had uh, two groups staying with us this past week. We had a, a group of eight dudes from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, staying here in the building. And then we had a, a group, a youth group from the Atlanta area staying across uh, the street at the 723 house, or we call it the bunk house now. Uh, and so we're still doing projects, helping people, trying to bring some hope into people's lives. This is the verse that, that, that we chose to be the theme verse for helping others. And this is what Jesus says to us. There's a t-shirt over here. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify who? And glorify your Father who is in heaven. God is going to use you to bring glory to his name. The problem with pride is that when we're full of ourselves, there's no room for God. So let's let Jesus undo something. Let Jesus undo the spiritual pride in your life. Humble yourself like the tax collector. Empty yourself and be filled by his grace. As we reflect on Jesus' sacrifice and prepare our hearts for a time of communion, I want to share a passage, passage of Scripture that has been read out loud several times uh, during a worship service. This, this passage ha has been read many times leading up to the Lord's Supper. But just because you guys have heard these words a bunch before, please don't tune out right now. I want you to focus in on the strength and the power of Jesus' humility. Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then he goes into detail what that attitude, what that mindset is. Who? Jesus, who, being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. At that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.